Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everybody uh, welcome to this uh, new course on optimal control guidance and estimation uh, typically it will be hovering around aerospace engineering uh, problems and applications things like that but uh, largely the techniques uh, i mean tricks and techniques will be very generic so anybody from any other discipline can also uh, use this concept uh, equally well i am radhakant fadi uh, working as a associate professor in department of aerospace engineering in an institute of science bangalore <coughs> So let's uh, see some of these uh, introduction, motivation, and things like that before we uh, go to the details of the course. This is the main objective of this particular lecture, actually. So before we start, uh, begin the some points to note. Uh, the topics covered in this course okay, are very uh, generic, uh, with preferential emphasis on aerospace applications, obviously, because largely, if you see this optimal control applications have been driven by aerospace engineering uh, traject optimization problems uh, conventionally. And we also want to uh, kind of develop the course this way. And uh, this course is meant to equip the students with applied optimal control system and state estimation concepts. Uh, so, as part of it, we will also take uh, this missile guidance and other aerospace vehicle guidance problems as well, which is nothing but an application of optimal control theory. That from that perspective, we will discuss actually. And the topics covered, as I told, are, are fairly mathematical. Uh, that means, uh, somebody who, who loves mathematics can uh, can enjoy it very well, uh, but if you if you are uh, reasonably good in mathematics, I think we will be able to follow it well, but that is a necessary requirement of this particular course. And I also suggest all of you that you can as the, as the course goes along, you take a sheet of paper, pencil and all you start kind of practicing everything yourself, then only the charm becomes even more actually. So, the topics to be covered in this particular course is uh, first thing is uh, some review of necessary fundamentals. It means we will talk about some numerical methods, matrix theory, algebra, matrix algebra, and, and whatever necessary background material that uh, that will be quickly reviewed. Then, followed by static optimization concepts, and that is a kind of a backbone for optimal control in a way because uh, even if you see one, uh, one method of solution of optimal control. Is, uh, is first to convert it to a static optimization problem and then take the advantage of the static optimization routines and all that. So, that uh, we need to know a little bit of uh, static optimization before we go ahead with the, with the optimal control principle, which is nothing but dynamic optimization. Mm -hmm. So, then we will uh, go to calculus of variations and uh, see some of the concepts of what is this calculus of variation. Obviously, it is a, a very vast topic, we will not be able to cover everything, but whatever is relevant to us, I think uh, that much we will be able to overview before proceeding to calculus of variation applications for optimal control. And that is what we will talk next, uh, optimal control through calculus of variations, then that will be followed by some numerical techniques to solve these uh, variational calculus problems, which essentially leads to this uh, something called two point boundary value problem. We will talk about that as, as the course develops actually. But that is one of the reasons uh, why it is computationally very uh, kind of uh, very challenging and computationally overwhelming rather. And then we will uh, proceed for other techniques, uh, recent techniques and, and classical as well as recent techniques to uh, how to overcome some of those actually. Anyway, after covering uh, numerical techniques, we will uh, move to this uh, something called LQR theory or linear quadratic regulator theory. And that will be followed by some overview of flight dynamics because most of the concepts we want to use in aerospace applications. So, it is better to know some of this flight dynamics on the way. Then we will see how LQR is used for flight control applications. Okay. So, some of the application uh, like stability augmentants uh, and then many variable enhancement and things like that. We will talk about that uh, as an application of LQR domain. Next uh, application of LQR will be optimal missile guidance. And that is uh, what a lot of people do using linear system system dynamics, rather engagement dynamics uh, between uh, uh, vehicle and target. That's what uh, they do. The missile and target, if you take relative motion and all, the, using that as a constraint, and then formulate some sort of a minimum uh, mistrusance problem, and then solve it using LQR theory. So th those details we will talk uh, after that. 
that will be followed by some of this uh, then we will venture into this nonlinear concept. So, after LQR uh, this which is largely um, uh, kind of uh, valid for linear systems, we will go and see how this uh, this similar kind of simple concepts can be extended to nonlinear problems as well and that will lead us to this uh, something called state dependent Riccardi equation approach. Okay. And then there is a, a little bit further development on that idea which is called theta d design. So, those things we will uh, we'll talk. And then we will quickly venture into this discrete time optimal control theory and then discrete time LQR and a very quick overview sort of thing. And that then we will follow to a very different approach which is called uh, dynamic programming and that will essentially lead to something called Hamilton Jacobi Bellman theory very famous. And then we will uh, see the ramifications of that actually. Okay. So, essentially the Hedgeby theory overcomes this uh, curse of complexity, but essentially it leads to curse of dimensionality that is uh, the, those details we will see that in a, when you talk about dynamic programming. And because of this curse of dimensionality people have thought about uh, something called approximate dynamic programming okay, in a discrete settings and all that. So, we will also discuss that and then use this approximate dynamic uh, programming concepts uh, for uh, adopt something called adaptive critic design. And uh, that uh, and that will be a little subset of that is uh, something called single network adaptive critic design, and that will be part of our discussion next actually. Then we'll venture into a different class of uh, problems, I mean different class of formulation, which is called model predictive static programming design. And again, this particular design has a huge potential for for guidance applications, and we'll see some of these examples actually there. Then after that we will follow to this estimation part of the story and these are all complementary problems uh, estimation and, uh, and optimal control sort of thing. So, we will see first what is called linear quadratic observer. Okay. So, that is uh, from there we will proceed to state estimation using Kalman filter and then uh, there is an idea of robust control through the concepts of optimal control and state estimation. Once you put them together it leads to something like robust control approach and all that we will see about that. Then on the way we cannot forget that, that there is a huge branch uh, of optimal control that is of relevance which is called constrained optimal control. That means, whatever solution we want it, it need not be only constrained by say, I mean state uh, dynamics uh, or system dynamics, but they can also contain some of these inequality constraints of control and state. So, that means, your uh, control for example, can be bounded between certain values. So, the, those bounds can be incorporated here as well as the state bounds as well actually. So, these are essentially some of these uh, inequality constraints and that uh, within that formulation how do we uh, solve this optimal control problem. So, it is possible to do and uh, some of these concepts we will see. Towards the end of the course we will go to a very ex uh, again a very different approach which is called transcription method and this transcription method is a very direct approach of solving uh, optimal control problem. That is what I just talked uh, that uh, you convert this optimal control problem which is a dynamic optimization problem to a static optimization problem with large variables, large number of variables. So, that is what is uh, the problem gets transcripted to a kind of a static optimization problem and that is why it is called tra transcription method. Some overview of that followed by some uh, little bit overview of what is called a pseudo spectral transcription. So, that is one of the things that is uh, getting lot of attention these days uh, and also it is uh, it's a very fast uh, approach in a way so much fast that it can probably be used online actually. So, so those kind of concepts uh, can be discussed towards the end of the course and uh, if time permits I will I will also give a glimpse of uh, the similar concepts that is uh, uh, optimal control systems as applicable to distributed parameter system and distributed parameter systems are nothing but systems governed by partial differential equations. There are a lot of applications again uh, this uh, flow control and then temperature control and flexibility uh, flexible body control things like that is all fall under the distributed parameter system, where the system dynamics is governed by PDs or partial differential equations which is uh, not very common in uh, in ODE domain basically. So, how do you uh, solve or how do you take those problems into account that, uh, that that is the topic of discussion next actually. So, this is how the course is structured uh, uh, there may be very slight variation here and there, but largely we will to we will stick to this this uh, outline of talks actually. Some of the references on the way you can uh, you can think of uh, probably buying some of these uh, books. Some of them are still available especially the first one is very much available and it is available in Indian edition as well. So, it is extremely cheap and one of my favorite systems uh, favorite books for, uh, for linear system optimal control is the second one uh, it is very clearly written and uh, I like it 
So, you can think of buying that and especially the third one happens to be a very, very classic book. Okay. It uh, if you remember if you, if you can notice it is published in 75, but it is still on print and it is perhaps the one book which is uh, most widely referred ever in the in the entire control system domain basically not necessarily only in optimal control. So, that is that kind of a impactful book it is uh, it has never seen a second edition, but still the first edition contains enough material for everybody to kind of look at it and then still keep on learning from it actually. So, I strongly recommend the third one uh, if somebody wants to get into this optimal control theory <coughs> and applications as well. Then there are other books which are again there is a Dover publication very cheap book uh, from uh, Stengel talks about optimal control as well as estimation uh, concepts and this uh, the this AP Sage and Sage and White book is also extremely well written book. In fact, before Bryson and who that was uh, one of the very popular books actually and it sustains its uh, legacy as well. In fact, uh, this distributed parameter control and some of these HJV equation concepts and all I will take it from Sage and White actually. All right. So, there are other books as well which is uh, this one is another very classic book a uh, lot of numerical techniques are discussed very well here. Uh, so, some of those uh, concepts can be read in detail there and there are other uh, publications as well for, for example, this JT Betts uh, he talks about uh, this uh, transcription method very well he is a very pioneer on that and then he has published many things uh, on transcription method as well and that is what uh, the book talks about actually. Then there are other uh, estimation theory concepts and this is uh, my most uh, favorite book uh, is Cressidus and Jenkins very rigorously written very much well written as well. And those of you want to buy uh, some estimation books probably you can buy this as well as uh, Dan Simon's book and uh, this is also extremely well written. However, uh, rigorous part is uh, much more in, uh, in Cressidus and Jenkins and I also think there is a second edition coming up it might uh, already come up in late 2012 or something that is my impression actually. And obviously, there will be topics taken from literature as well that means, uh, some journal and conference publications are also included as part of this course actually. So, uh, take a close note of all these things and I am sure everything will be quite uh, enjoyable experience actually. So, let us go to some some degree of uh, introduction and motivation first uh, before we go into this uh, math, math details and, uh, and uh, try to explore more. So, coming to the introduction and motivation first, uh, very, very basic concepts. So, so first thing is uh, what is called a system variable. Then we talk about two type of variables. One is uh, input, I mean it largely it can be classified as something like input variable, output variable and, and kind of state variables. So, what is input? Input can again be like uh, some control input which is nothing but a manipulative set of variables that you can uh, or we can rather vary as we wish and then this can be computed precisely as well. Okay, the, but there are other class of inputs and remember these are actually inputs to the system which is called noise input. In, in other words, they, they do come as a common input to the system and they do disturb the system. In other words, for example, if you go on a car then the road conditions and all will affect the car drive. That is not a control system, but that is a noise input to the system. Similarly, when aircraft flies then there is a something called a atmospheric gust phenomenon and all. So, that will disturb the vehicle motion as well. So, those are noise inputs usually they are non manipulated not under our control, but we have to live with that we have to handle that and that is how this necessity of robust control comes in all that. Then there are two kinds of output variables as well and one is uh, one set of output variables that you can measure by sensors that is called uh, sensor outputs, but they need not be something that you want to control. So, the control can be something same or different and the, the, the variable that you really want to control the system or you want to have a performance measure whether the system is performing well or not those things can be uh, described as something called performance output actually. Okay. So, sensor and performance output may or may not be same. Then there is something called uh, state variables and the state variables are uh, nothing but a set of variables that describe a system completely. That means, we will see some examples uh, I mean you might have already seen in lot of test books uh, uh, in, in systems theory and state variables are, uh, are there are certain restrictions they cannot be you cannot uh, take more state variables than necessary you cannot take less state variables uh, than necessary either. There are again problems and, uh, and advantages of that and things like that those of you are uh, interested can see a classic uh, test book on, on these concepts actually. Then, we, when you talk about system study in general and there, there are three categories of system study. One is uh, model development which can also include 
parameter identification in general and uh, typically we will not talk about that. In other words, uh, we will assume that the model is uh, typically available to us as far as uh, control system uh, synthesis problem is concerned. In other words, as a control system designer, we will not worry too much on modern development issues and all that actually. So, we will assume that it is it is known to us in a way. Then there are uh, system analysis concepts. So, that means, once you have a system uh, model or a mathematical set of equations for representing the model behavior, then you essentially want to know whether the system is behaving properly or not. So, that, that will lead to something called system analysis uh, and typical example is uh, whether the system is stable or not stable, whether the system is uncontrollable or not controllable. So, those kind of issues are uh, part of uh, system analysis problem. And uh, if the system analysis output is good, uh, that means system is behaving well, we do not want to do anything. But if something that needs to be done, then we go to the system synthesis part. That means, we design a set of control inputs in such a way that the system performance is satisfactory actually. So, in other words, we force the system to behave as we would like to see actually, that is how. And typically, we will uh, kind of give emphasis on the on this type of issues and especially on the system synthesis part of it. The analysis will be there in a weak sense, uh, but largely we will talk about system synthesis. In other words, how do we actually design a control uh, variable uh, using this concept of uh, optimization or dynamic optimization. That is what the main uh, objective of this course actually. Then when it uh, there are various classification again, uh, so when you talk about a system, uh, uh, you can classify in variety of ways. One is uh, lumped parameter systems where uh, uh, there is no relative motion between two molecules of the system. In uh, other words, everything if the if the center of gravity moves, then every other particle moves in the same way, same direction, same velocity like that. So that is uh, lumped parameter system. And then there is a distributed parameter system where uh, where you have relative uh, I mean the relative uh, motion between two molecules are also there as uh, along with the whole system getting perturbed as well. So, those are the system that can be described only using partial differential equations whereas, this fellows uh, lumped parameter systems can be used in I mean can be described in uh, uh, using uh, this uh, ordinary differential equations and all that actually. Then there are different classes of systems uh, when you talk about uh, continuous time systems where the time variable is treated as continuous variable versus there is a discrete time system where you talk about only discrete grid points and then see the behavior at those grid points only. Then there are ideas of quantized system, non-quantized system things like that and there are something called uh, quantized means the variables uh, are uh, given at a discrete uh, number uh, and the, the quantity of the variable can change only in discrete numbers actually. Non-quantized is uh, something that varies continuously in other words all rational numbers are also accounted for there and all that actually. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, then there is a concept called a time invariant system and there is something called time varying system basically. Uh, so, that means, uh, if the parameters of the systems can change in time, then this leads to this time varying system. Uh, for a typical example is when uh, when an aircraft moves, you burn fuel and the rocket moves, you burn fuel. So, the system has sees a different mass as the as time goes actually. So, that means, mass moment of inertia all that keeps on changing. Uh, and if that does not happen, the, uh, then we talk about something like a time invariant system. So, you can think of roughly you can think of it as a kind of a UAV flying under electric propulsion probably. If, if it is electric propulsion, there is no expendable mass goes there, it is only the charge and all that, that way. But then uh, other any every other thing remains constant, the, there is no person moving there. So, they do not move around, uh, the mass remains same, moment of inertia remains same. I mean, these kind of systems can be thought about something like uh, time invariant system actually. Then there are uh, something like linear systems or uh, and versus nonlinear systems. Uh, largely, linear systems turns out to be linearized systems of, of nonlinear systems because nature uh, typically gives nonlinear systems. Anyway, uh, coming back, uh, if you if somebody analyzes a system using discrete time theory as well as quantization theory, then it essentially leads to something called digital control. Whereas, the continuous time and non-quantized variable combination of that leads to analog control. And it so happens uh, most of the time that we confine in courses uh, to the uh, first line. That means, we discuss lumped parameter systems largely in continuous time domain using non-quantized variables, assuming time invariant systems and linearizing the system. Whereas, the reality is, uh, is all in the bottom actually, mostly in the bottom rather. So, the reality most of the systems uh, theoretically speaking at least can be described in, in distributed parameter systems, 
even though largely lump tolerance systems are also okay uh, from engineering perspective point of view. And then there are discrete time theories typically nowadays uh, not given that much of importance uh, and quantized theory as well because computers have become very fast and continuous time and unquantized and all. Even if you quantize it a very, uh, I mean if you quantize it at a very fast uh, rate and then it becomes almost equivalent to that kind, kind, kind of a continuous time and, and unquantized sense and all that. So, that is not that much of a big deal nowadays. However, time varying parameters as well as nonlinear systems are, are typically uh, reality. I mean, we just cannot wish it away. But unfortunately, most of the courses in, in classes will be talking about linear systems and all that. So, and this particular course will talk both linear systems as well as nonlinear system. As a whole, entire thing we want to see in a in totality sort of thing. So, if it happens to be a linear system, well and good, it has it, it has its own advantage and all that. Uh, but we do not want to confine everything in and around linear systems actually. All right, so let us uh, move on. Uh, then, uh, very quickly, what is a linear system then? A linear system is something, uh, some system that obeys uh, principle of superposition. In other words, multiplying the input by any constant alpha must multi multiply the uh, output by the same constant alpha, as well as this, uh, this is the kind of law of multiplication and this is law of addition as well. So, this is uh, so the response to several inputs applied simultaneously, must be some of the individual inputs to each input applied separately. So, the all these things I think is a very standard things in uh, in textbooks uh, in linear systems theory especially. So, you can uh, I mean this course is not geared up towards that. So, I will not uh, spend too much of time on those lines actually, but still uh, just a very quick example. If it uh, if you consider a static system that means there is no differential equation or anything, but the system is given by this kind of equation. Typically, the very first impression that you get is, is a linear equation, correct. It is a linear equation, but it is not a linear system because it does not uh, necessarily linear unless e is 0 actually. It is not uh, not really linear. You can very quickly see y 1 if it is like that and y 2 is uh, m x 2 plus c, y 1 is m x 1 plus c, then y 1 plus y 2 is m into x 1 plus x 2 plus 2 c. So, that 2 c is not equal to c and hence it will not satisfy this uh, this law of uh, addition and all that itself. So, it is essentially it will satisfy everything if uh, provided c is 0 basically. So, that means if the line passes through the origin then it can consider that as a linear expression. Otherwise, it is equation of a straight line it is uh, certainly not a kind of a linear equation actually. So, those kind of ideas so typically we forget actually. I will just keep it in mind. Similarly, in, in dynamical systems as well if you have a differential equation and all if it is in this form then it is actually a linear form because very quickly you can verify this law of uh, multiplication and addition actually. So, if you take uh, like alpha into x dot and you can multiply with uh, alpha the right hand side and then put 2 into alpha x. So, that is part of that and second equation is like that actually if you take x 1 and x 2 and then try to validate all that it will turn out to be like that actually. Okay. Then uh, if you have this uh, uh, kind of example 2 which is actually a nonlinear system the moment you have a bias there it is it will not satisfy and then hence it is not a linear system. And if you talk about this kind of a system as well it again it will not satisfy this principle of superposition 2 sin x and things like that. So, so again it is not a linear system actually. So, by the way a, a, a nonlinear system by definition is something that is not necessarily linear. That means, all linear systems can be thought about as part of nonlinear family as well actually, but not necessarily vice versa. Okay. So, in other words if you if you study a concept uh, which is applicable for nonlinear systems it is actually equally valid for linear systems as well. So, do not forget that part of it actually. And then uh, there are some concepts called analogous systems that means, the uh, if you take two systems for which the mathematical representations are similar, but their physical meanings may be different. So, mathematically these systems are kind of similar uh, behaviors, uh, they will have uh, similarity, but uh, physical meaning sense they will be having different uh, things actually. For example, in spring mass damper system in mechanical systems is very very equivalent to RLC systems in, in electrical systems. So, these two systems uh, as far as system theory is concerned are considered as analogous system. So, the math theory and all that will be very very similar, it is the physical interpretation that needs to be different actually. All right. So now coming back to the some uh, some differences between linear systems, non-linear systems, some similarity, blah blah, all that thing it can be summarized something like this. And uh, this is uh, uh, very very easy to see that non-linear systems are more realistic. And linear systems, as I told, uh, usually do not exist in uh, nature. All that we do is math simplicity, 
and you take Taylor series expansion and then forget the rest of the series and keep it only up to linear term. So, that is certainly an approximation to reality. Right. Then uh, nonlinear systems uh, they are typically uh, more difficult to analyze and design, okay, but uh, linear systems are usually simpler in those aspects. So, the linear system there are a lot of tools already well developed and here tools are getting developed, they are partly done, partly not done. So, there are a lot of scope for doing further research as well actually. But the main difference what you see in for nonlinear system, the, the difficulty starts from here, it tells okay, the system uh, system can have multiple equilibrium point. It is very easy to give examples uh, for sake of time I will not give that, but suppose you take uh, let us say x dot equal to like x q minus x let us say something like that, then it is uh, if you take x dot 0, then it is x equal to 0 and plus or minus 1 it will all satisfy. So, the in equilibrium sense you will have minus 1, 0 and plus 1 all these things are candidates actually. But if you take a linear system that is not a um, uh, that is not a choice actually you will always land up with a uh, single equilibrium say, I mean point and that equilibrium point happens to be origin actually. And uh, okay, now the more difficulty is the system stability depends on initial condition as well for nonlinear system. So, it is not that you have only multiple equilibrium points, but the system stability behavior itself will will, uh, will change depending on uh, what equilibrium point you are talking about. Around that the system can be stable, around some other equilibrium point it can be unstable as well actually. That kind of behavior is typically not seen here. Uh, the stability nature is in fact getting uh, independent of initial condition here because you have only one in the one equilibrium point and whether the system is stable or unstable does not necessarily depend on that uh, that equilibrium point, it does not actually. In fact, uh, if your system is stable, it is globally asymptotically stable, I mean globally exponentially stable rather. In other words, no matter wherever the initial condition is there, the system is stable means from all uh, for all those points initial conditions, the trajectory will develop towards 0 actually. Uh, if it is unstable from, uh, from any, for every point other than that equilibrium point, uh, the system trajectory will get to in, go to instab instability or go to, in, go to infinity actually. So, those kind of behaviors are not seen in uh, linear, I mean non-linear system, they, they are critical, it depends on the equilibrium point as well actually. Then there are concepts called limit cycle which is a kind of a self sustained oscillation, there are concepts of bifurcation, in other words this number of equilibrium points and their stability nature do not stay constant, they can vary with uh, with parameter values as well and especially if it is a time varying system where the parameter values are changing, then you can essentially lead to this uh, bifurcation issues and all that actually. There. Now, there is a concept called chaos and then chaos are very small difference in initial condition can lead to large difference in prediction. In other words, if, uh, if you have a very small uh, two initial conditions that are very close to each other, but they are not identically same. Then if you propagate the system dynamics of for, for some time, then uh, the behavior will be very different. The dispersion will become wider and wider actually. And to a point uh, very quickly you will see that difference blowing up, see the, words, the, the system simulation is no more reliable actually. And very, very common example of chaotic system is weather systems really. So, that is the short duration weather prediction becomes easy, the long duration becomes difficult because the no matter how much good instrumentation and computation you can have, uh, uh, the system being chaotic you cannot pr propagate the system dynamics or the system model for a long time and then tell your trajectory being reliable and all that. So, that is the problem of a chaotic system actually. Now, also there are other issues like frequency and amplitude can get coupled uh, and then you have uh, you have associated problems with that. Uh, so, you cannot uh, take sinusoidal signals and then analyze only in frequency and amplitude relationship and things like that. So, there are problems with that frequency domain analysis does not typically hold good here. So, in other words if you see a frequency domain analysis uh, especially using this Laplace transform and things like that is a typically very for linear systems only, I do not forget that part actually. So, when you talk to nonlinear systems Laplace transforms are or even Fourier transforms and things, things like that that are typically not valid there. So, you, do, you, you lose this frequency domain uh, luxury or frequency domain interpretation and then directly you have to deal with time domain only. Okay. So, that is uh, that is how the nonlinear systems are. Then a quick overview of what is classical versus modern control, uh, these are all little bit old concept, uh, largely classical control is developed largely between first world war and second world war. Uh, modern control, what I call is linear modern control, this x dot equal to x plus v u sort of thing that is developed between these things uh, after second world war largely. Okay. And then typically these are frequency domain analysis, whereas these are time domain analysis. 
and classical control is based on single input single output models uh, or is modern control based on multiple input multiple output and remember optimal control theory is all based on this this modern control concepts actually okay so we will uh, we'll largely this course will concern i mean kind of hover around this modern control concepts actually so there are other other things as well you can uh, read some of these things the the very good reason why this classical control is uh, still popular is uh, is because of this issue the, there is something called gain and phase margin concept which is very very well defined in classical control domain where people get comfortable with the robustness properties of the system on the design actually so that is typically not available here even though in a phase margin sense we can talk about time delay margin in gain margin sense there is some issues there actually so it's not extremely well connected that way but things are under development as well but uh, where this thing thing comes into big way is something called controllability and observability issue in other words uh, if the system is controllable then only it makes sense to kind of uh, go ahead and find various control design schemes that are uh, and then evaluate them if the system is not controllable then it implies that uh, uh, no control system is going to work no design is going to work so it is better that we don't waste our time actually similarly if it is system is not observable then uh, no observer is going to work so there is no point in uh, in aiming for an observer and or an estimator and things like that and then struggling and wasting our time on that actually so those are the concepts that are available in the modern control domain only and the big point is uh, we not only see this classical control you can is largely stability based theory and it is actually whether the system is stable or unstable yeah. whereas in the modern control part of it uh, i mean we can also talk about something called optimality in other words in what sense the control uh, is optimal whether it is minimum time minimum resistance minimum what actually you can talk about that maximum profit okay, all sort of things uh, we can discuss in a very neat sense actually from the optim from the modern control perspective and that is where optimal control comes into picture actually all right so the some of the benefits of advanced control theory first of all it's a memo theory that means multiple input multiple outputs so that essentially leads to lesser assumptions and approximations so we don't have to ignore this cross coupling effects and all that you account for that and then design your control actually and then there are concept of simultaneous disturbance rejection and command following that means there are typically conflicting requirements okay we have, uh, we have to dis reject the disturbance uh, and assure that uh, command is being followed so that is typically a kind of conflicting requirement but can be done because you are not ignoring the cross coupling effect and you are talking you know, taking power of uh, modern math and things like that so it is possible to take into account all that then you can also talk about robustness issues in presence of parameter variations uh, external disturbances on model dynamics or neglected dynamics or uh, inaccuracy of parameter variables things like that then even bigger things you can talk about something called fault tolerant control that means if your system is under operation your aircraft is flying and then you have developed some fault in actually in other words the actuator gets stuck and all that so how do you how do you still make sure that your aircraft lands or still make sure that your system behaves in a little tolerable way at least so it's a very big implication if you talk about uh, let's say nuclear power plants then if something goes bad it, uh, it should not uh, really lead to a catastrophe or a disaster actually so those kind of control system can be thought about can be analyzed can be developed and all using this advanced control theory then there are concepts of self autonomy and some of these things we will see that uh, see the when you talk about guidance the guidance is essentially leads to the self autonomy sort of concept where uh, the algorithms and all are designed in such a way that there is uh, intermittent uh, human intervention uh, intervention is not necessary once you fire it you fire it and then the logic takes over then the sensor uh, are integrated to the actuators and the sensor information will be processed to the computer and it will pass to the actuator directly actually so then uh, the system is uh, autonomous i mean you really don't have to control anything you don't need to bother about that as well actually so those are the concepts uh, for uh, autonomy and and there are uh, very very challenging research problems as well for example if you are uh, some unmanned aerial vehicle you have flies and then you have a camera there then how can you, you make use of the camera photograph so that you can sense then an, an obstacle and an avoid it actually so those kind of thing you don't have to manually turn it right and left and then go and all that so it will take care of that itself similar concepts are there in robotics as well and and things like that so it's a big field and typically when you talk about autonomy this vehicle guidance comes into picture and here we are going to see how to design guidance schemes using optimal control theory so essentially optimal guidance schemes actually 
So, why nonlinear control in general? Uh, there are certain benefits. First thing is uh, we can think about improving the existing control systems and uh, some neglected physics can be accounted for and uh, then there are something like some explicit accounts of hard nonlinearity versus strong nonlinearity. Okay, what is hard nonlinearity? Uh, this talks about discontinuity in derivatives. For example, saturation, dead zone, hysteresis, all that. Those are nothing but hard nonlinearity. That can be accounted for. Then there are strong nonlinearities, so essentially higher order terms in the Taylor series. So uh, that kind of both the things can be handled here actually. Okay. Then it can directly deal with model uncertainties as well, and uh, sometimes it can lead to design simplicity as well. And that is a little bit surprised, but it turns out to be true. In other words, if you go through linear control system, the, the theory may be easy, but it uh, remember it is locally valid. That means, you have to really go for uh, designing a set of nonlinear systems uh, everywhere that is uh, that is of interest to you. And then, you talk about stitching them through something called gain scheduling. Okay. So, that gain scheduling process turns out to be quite uh, challenging, it is quite uh, Cumbersome. It is. It is also problem dependent. It is, is a discipline dependent. It a lot of exposure comes and a lot of uh, your prior experience will be helpful. And if the system uh, goes through a design iteration and the system dynamics changes, then you have to repeat the entire exercise. So those kind of ideas are not necessarily true when you talk about nonlinear system control in general, basically. And it can also lead to better performance optimality. So if you a branch of nonlinear control which can be designed through optimal control and all that then obviously, you can talk about performance optimality actually. So, that is that is another bigger advantage coming into picture. So, in general techniques of nonlinear control uh, uh, can be thought about uh, many things. First thing very simple in a if you if your state space contains two or at the maximum three states, then you can think of something called phase plane analysis. In other words, you plot uh, different states x 1 versus x 2 or x 1, x 2, x 3 and eliminate the time part and uh, that will have certain meaning actually that kind of things are called phase plane analysis. Then uh, there is a branch uh, uh, called Lyapunov theory based thing. So, you define a positive definite function and, uh, and if the derivative of the time derivative of that turns out to be a negative definite function, then system is stable and those concepts fall under this uh, this Lyapunov theory and things like that. Okay. And uh, uh, I mean this uh, something called differential geometry based thing or otherwise uh, known as feedback linearization. And there are intelligent techniques as well using neural network, fuzzy logic, genetic algorithm, things like that, biological inspired computing and, and much more actually. Then there are concepts of describing function analysis uh, and lastly, but usually, I mean we are usually concerned about this uh, uh, which is called optimal control theory, comes from this variational optimization or dynamic programming approach etcetera like that actually. That is where our, our focus will be for this entire course actually. I mean just a comment before I move on, uh, if somebody is interested in Lyapunov theory and differential geometry based uh, control theory using this feedback linearization as well as Lyapunov theory based uh, this backstepping analysis and other things like that, uh, you can probably refer to my first course which is which is already available under this NPTEL program actually. Alright, so what is this uh, this optimal control, so for a in a nutshell sort of thing and uh, to understand that uh, if you see any classical control system book probably you will come across uh, this kind of a diagram where uh, this g of s is supposed to be a system uh, plant dynamics and you have a something like a output and this output needs to be a kind of uh, uh, tracking problem since it output has to go to r of s that means c of s should, uh, should approach r of s uh, with time. So, that means you have error signal there and then this error signal is manipulated in a, in a control gain and that is fed back to that. So, in a control and plan together since this GFS comes into picture, you have this unity feedback or non-unity feedback and all sort of things there. So, this is a very standard thing actually. So, essentially if you look at it, I mean this is nothing but a stabilizing control design problem sort of thing. You design a control gain in such a way that the closed loop plan dynamics whatever you see here uh, is stable, in other words it drives to 0 actually. All that things are fine, I mean uh, no, uh, no questions on that, but uh, if, uh, if I ask a little question that what is R of S, uh, most of the books will turn out that okay, this R of X are nothing but this uh, step input, ramp input and all sort of things. Typically those step input, ramp input, parabolic input are, are certainly not reference signal for a plan to operate. Uh, so, for any realistic system if you just confine yourself to those kind of signals, then obviously the, the, you are not going to go anywhere actually. But still we want to test our control system for that, uh, the reason being uh, any arbitrary signal 
can be actually decomposed uh, to this uh, I mean kind of constant signal uh, uh, then uh, ramp input and all sort of things using Taylor series actually. So, that is the backbone why it is done. So, if you if you have any arbitrary signal if your system behaves well with respect to let us say step input, ramp input and parabolic that means, you have actually testing for uh, first three terms in the Taylor series that is the, that is why it is done actually. But okay, moving ahead uh, in other words uh, what is the RFS that will lead me for system optimization overall goal to be achieved that means, uh, that is where this RFS will play a major role because if I have to guide a missile, guide a missile then I have to guide it towards the target. Once the guidance is part uh, is taken care that means, RFS is designed well then it will be tracked actually. But what is the th problem that uh, how can I do that actually? So, this RFS coming uh, come up with a value for our RFS actually. So, this is what I want to talk a little bit here. So, if you that is the thing we question is what is RFS and how to design it and unfortunately, many of the books will remain completely silent on this. But think a little and if you just uh, just think about doing this actually, okay, you take the similar output sort of thing and then you design an RFS, RFS in, a, in some sort of outer loop sense actually. And that is typically done in using some optimization criterion that means, if you are running a power plant then your overall load should be at a particular level for your system to operate uh, nicely. If you are talking about a missile guidance problem your missed distance has to be 0 at the end. So, all sort of things are nothing but optimal control problems. So, so this is the loop that you are talking about uh, in designing here in optimal control actually. And uh, what are the summary of benefits uh, for, for using optimal control? And uh, first of all, a variety of difficult real life problems can be formulated in the framework of optimal control. Do not think that optimal control is just another approach of solving actually. The, the many difficult problems uh, which cannot be solved otherwise using any of these Lyapunov theory based uh, uh, techniques or feedback generation based techniques and all can, can be actually handled very well using optimal control. That means, it actually gives us a very powerful technique or powerful platform to handle those problems actually. And then state and control bounds can be incorporated in the control design process explicitly. Typically, it is not true in stability based design. In, a, in other words, you design a system uh, I mean stabilizing controller and evaluate it uh, using this bounds and all that. If it does not then go back and retune it and the tuning process can depend on your experience and all that actually. Here you are not talking about that uh, state and control bounds if it is known a priori then those can be explicitly incorporated while designing the control itself. So, that is uh, that is a big departure uh, philosophically. Then obviously, they you can also incorporate optimality issues uh, for a variety of advantages uh, for example, minimum cost, maximum efficiency and then it will lead to this non-conservative design and all that actually. That is a big advantage. Uh, uh, that we can actually talk that the controller is optimal in this particular sense. Okay, so, that we will be able to discuss as well. Then uh, essentially it also I mean if your optimal control can be solved very fast uh, then essentially it leads to some trajectory planning issues can be uh, I mean it, so essentially optimal control is nothing but a trajectory planning issue basically. So, how the trajectory evolves over a period of time that means, uh, the only problem there is uh, uh, computational problem. Now, the computational problem is taken out in other words there are techniques which you can uh, use it for solving it very fast. Then essentially it amounts to that trajectory planning issues can also be incorporated into guidance and control design actually. That is uh, nothing is th this kind of uh, big advantages are not possible in the in the stability based design actually. Okay. So, what are the difficulties it uh, I mean these are all nice features. So, these are the benefits part of it, but what are the difficulties? The difficulty is uh, very fact, say a kind of uh, open fact or it is known to everybody that optimal control problems are computationally very intensive and do not think that your modern computers can solve it, uh, they are nowhere, nowhere close, even the supercomputer of today is nowhere close to solve a real good trajectory optimization problem in real time actually. So, uh, these are actually computational difficult problems and hence uh, they are difficult to solve in, in real time as well. Now, the question is uh, can the computational difficulty be avoided at least to some class of systems, class of problems and things like that. So, that the it can be actually useful for real time applications ok and uh, the answer turns out to be yes and you can do that uh, for a variety of things and the first thing is LQR problems traditionally all done in 60s and 70s and things like that. So, I yes, say uh, but if the, but the system has to be linear first of all and linear time invariant most of the time. So, then only you can use think of using this LQR problem. There also you need to solve something like a Riccati equation which may or may not be 
solvable online if your number of states are more actually. But for a reasonably decent uh, practical application, you can think about using uh, LQR technique and the Ricard equation can be solved online and that is what is SDRE method actually essentially. So, this, uh, this SDRE method uh, is a little more than that obviously, we will talk about that when you go there, but essentially it amounts to solving a Ricard equation online basically, so that, is, that is what it is. Theta D tries to avoid it, it, uh, it uh, kind of gives you something one uh, Ricard equation offline solution and a bunch of Lyapunov equation online solution, there is its own computational advantages actually. Then there are other techniques, uh, pseudospectral method, adaptive critic, uh, this MPSP method and things like that. So, these are the things that you are going to talk in this course as well. Okay, so, there are uh, I mean all these th things that I am putting here is actually we will uh, talk in detail as we go along actually. So, what are the key components of an optimal control formulation? Uh, mathematically speaking, first of all it needs a performance index that needs to be optimized okay, and then there is to be some sort of appro appropriate boundary condition and essentially when somebody talks about boundary condition, it uh, amounts to initial and final condition. So, you have a set of initial conditions uh, and you have a set of final condition and again both can be either soft constraint or hard constraint. That means, if you talk about my initial condition value has to be equal to some value or finally, uh, my mesh distance has to be equal to 0. So, those kind of uh, demands are, are hard and hence they are called hard constraints, but if you talk about okay, mesh distance can be minimum, I mean I do not really bother about it is 0, but it is uh, within some let us say 5, 10 meters and all that, but I do not, I am very not, I am not very particular that it has to be exactly 0 or exactly 1 meter thing like that. Then uh, it amounts to something called soft constraint actually and both are possible in this framework. Then there are path constraints and uh, as I told first thing first uh, is the system dynamic constraint. Okay, so, the every system has their own dynamic equation and that has the, that uh, is accounted for explicitly as a set of path constraints actually and they are they can be nonlinear in general actually. Okay. Uh, so, then there are state constraints and control constraints and as I told sometime before uh, they can be inequality constraints actually. So, all these things can be incorporated as part of the problem formulation itself basically. So, mathematically speaking uh, it amounts to like finding an admissible time history of control variable uh, within this initial time to final time which causes the system governed by this set of nonlinear equation. Remember this is a nonlinear uh, set of differential equations so with n number of states and uh, time varying as well actually. So, it is actually non-autonomous set of systems where time expli explicitly appears in system dynamics that all that is also possible. Uh, most of the system will not have that uh, in our modeling and all, but even if it is there it is possible to account for that. So, essentially it uh, amounts to finding the control variable uh, accounting for this uh, system dynamics uh, and then not only that it will find a solution, it needs to find a solution for an admissible trajectory and the state variable x of t whatever it turns out it has to be admissible as well. And on the way it has to minimize or maximize a meaningful performance index and a performance index in general can be given something like this. But it is not the only form, it can be you can design your own uh, I mean own cost function as well, it's also called as cost function, it is uh, either uh, you can talk about performance index or cost function either way. And this also has to satisfy certain appropriate boundary condition. So, all these things has to be part of the formulation itself and if something is missing then obviously, it is not a optimal solution actually. And personally speaking, I mean in a, in a personal bias sense, I think uh, satisfaction of these constraints are the biggest advantage of this uh, this optimal control theory and as a byproduct we also optimize certain cost function and all that. So, that is uh, that is my opinion actually. So, there are certain meaningful some examples of meaningful performance index in this in this framework. Uh, you can think about uh, some minimum time problem then it is nothing but minimizing T f minus T 0. So, I can in, in this platform I can think about putting this okay if, uh, that uh, one uh, I can take uh, L equal to 1 and phi equal to 0 and I can I can talk about a minimum time problem. And uh, minimum control effort problem can be thought about uh, something like U transpose R U and uh, U transpose R U turns out to be something uh, uh, like uh, R 1 times uh, U 1 square plus R 2 times U 2 square things like that. Uh, eventually, if you minimize that it will lead to everything being uh, 0 or close to 0 that is where you get minimum control effort. 
Also, if you think about like let us say minimum deviation of a fixed value, I mean the state should be having minimum deviation from fixed value and also you want to have minimum control effort. You, know, you can think about uh, this kind of problem say something like uh, helicopter hovering problem for example. And then you can think about this, uh, this x is the position x, y, z and then this should be a specific location c and that is what you want to minimize this is a quadratic term everything uh, I mean this is something like x minus is an error quantity sort of thing. So, you can take up that term and then along with that minimum control effort can also be there and also you can give relative weights here which I have not uh, given, but if you if you think about that you can give some, some relative weight something like u here and something like r here and then there are some requirements that q has to be positive semi definite and r has to be positive definite actually. Okay, so, these kind of things uh, are also possible where you can talk about relative weightage being assigned to two different terms actually. So, those things are, are all possible here. Okay. Then uh, this uh, okay, why state estimation? So they also remember there is a part of the course talks about a state estimation, and there are certain needs actually. First of all, the state feedback control design needs some sort of a state information for for control computation. You you need state variable for that, and your sensors may not give that. So you need some sort of estimation technique there. And uh, okay, why it is not? Uh, I mean, not there. Uh, start no, in other words, all state variables are not um, available. There, are, there can be various reasons. Some possible reasons can be some something like non-availability of sensor, or maybe the sensor is available but it is a, but it is expensive. Okay, uh, and then it is also not a possible candidate. Okay, and then sometimes the quality of sensors uh, may not be acceptable due to noise. Uh, that also is a concern. So, uh, any of these issues can tell you okay, I will not be able to use all sort of sensors to get my all state variables. Okay, so, then uh, we go to this observer theory and the state observer essentially estimates the state variable based on the measurement of some of the output variables as well as the process information that is critical actually. They are not just dependent on the output variable only which is actually sensor output. So, give, given to us from sensor values but it will also account for something like system dynamics. So, that is where the process information comes into picture. So, accounting for all that it will try to predict which is with the prediction becomes much more uh, kind of robust actually. So, what is the main aspects of estimation? There are uh, there are different things one is prediction you have to predict in the future then filtering current uh, value whatever it is supposed to be you will we'll find it out that is called filtering. And then smoothing that means, uh, if the process is over and you go back and see what uh, what should have happened and things like that, that that process is called smoothing actually. So, the so the three aspects of uh, estimation is uh, prediction, filtering as well as smoothing actually. It can also take care of limited inaccuracy of system modeling. Um, uh, in other words, uh, because you are typically relying on estimated states. So, uh, this uh, sensor information is going to help you even if your model is inaccurate actually. Okay. So, that kind of uh, thing gives you a little bit additional robustness actually. And this estimation can also be used for parameter estimation techniques uh, or it essentially useful for system identification as well. Okay. So, okay, you can think of uh, um, uh, some other applications of estimation which is okay. first thing is you can think about something like model development uh, uh, as I told you can estimate the parameters. So, that is part of the model development. And you can also talk about state parameter estimation combined actually. So, the, that can be thought about that uh, and people are using that actually in fact. So, estimation techniques especially Kalman filter and all are extremely useful for both state estimation, parameter estimation, parameter state estimation combined and is it there are huge uh, other applications, uh, huge number of other applications as well we do not uh, as you go along we will see that some of this. It can also talk about something like uh, fault detection and identification there uh, uh, that is a uh, part of uh, this reconfigurable control if you think of control theory point of view. But essentially if you simply want to have an information where the system is going fault I mean where is the fault lie where does the fault lies and when it happened and things like that. So, that can be falling under this this FDI what is uh, fault detection and identification. Okay, so, one branch of reconfigurable control leads to this uh, I mean relies on this FDI concept that means, uh, I will uh, detect where the fault lies and I will identify that properly and then there is a revised uh, plant model for that and then using that model I will resynthesize the control actually. So, that will go that way actually. So, it is possible to do this fault detection identification using estimation concepts. Then there are estimation of states and other related systems, uh, especially non-cooperative systems and exogenous inputs and things like that can also be there. 
you can uh, very very it is uh, related to aerospace problems uh, especially for let us say missile guidance actually. So, you need some target information, but target is not going to declare its position or velocity or intention to maneuver and things like that. So, this is something that you have to estimate as part of your sensor measurement and all that and that is an integral part of requirement actually. So, target state estimate without target state estimation missile guidance probably has uh, a very little significance actually. So, that is where the you need this estimation concepts to make your system overall system work uh, I mean as per your requirement actually. All right. So, there are applications uh, as I told first application uh, in guidance and control uh, of missiles and essentially I am talking about uh, applications of uh, optimal control and estimation some both actually. Okay, so, first thing is missile guidance and control. So, we require uh, several reasons. Uh, one the first thing that we require is rapid and precise command response and it should also take care of system limitations. Uh, for example, the missiles do not have uh, large pins for small radar signatures and all that and they can they can be tail control also that means it leads to this something called non minimum phase systems and all. So, those are the system limitations that you have uh, which needs to be accounted for and it can optimal control can account for actually. And then there are concepts called disturbance rejection for example, wind gust, motor burnout, state separation things like that will lead to this uh, system dynamics getting disturbed uh, as it operates it has to tolerate all that actually. Then the prediction of target behaviors through state estimation I already explained about that actually. Then moving on in aerospace domain itself, uh, we can uh, take some of these concepts uh, and then talk about a lot of these uh, UAV application these days. And uh, first of all, UAV autonomous level, you can think about waypoint guidance uh, where you can define this waypoint 1, 2, 3, 4 and the, to the vehicle has to move around all these and come back things like that. So, those kind of autonomy can be brought in. And then there are autono automatic takeoff and landing algorithms uh, where that has to be autonomously done. Then there are collision avoidance problems, so where uh, it, it flies and then tries to avoid collision either for known obstacle or unknown obstacles on the way. So, those kind of problems can be handled using uh, optimal control theory. And then you have this formation flying uh, issues, so that means a number of vehicles have to fly in formation, a number of robots has to go in coordination things like that. So, those can be handled and then cooperative missions where large number of different different uh, small systems have to operate cooperatively, uh, th those kind of with and and without uh, uh, leader formulation and things like that are available. So, those are those can be handled as well. Then there are aircraft flight control issues as well. Uh, they can think about uh, something like a fly wire wire system where the, there is a something like the open loop system is unstable, but there is part of the feedback which is automatically done irrespective of pilot input and all that where that the, where that will make the system stable. That is something called a stability augmentation. Then you have this maneuver announcement things are also possible using feedback. Uh, uh, theory that kind of thing and especially this cruise control and all instability augmentation you can think of using LQR theory and things like that. That is actually done in that way also LQZ theory essentially which is LQR theory plus Kalman filter and all that that way. Then there are concepts for load elevation and then the structural mode control and then flutter flut margin augmentation things like that. So, there are enormous number of uh, problems enormous challenging problems rather in aerospace engineering and especially in other engineering as well actually I am not uh, kind of confining only to aerospace, but you can think about many other problems like vibration control problem, flow control and all that which is equally valid for, for mechanical civil engineering problems. You can the, yeah, also you can think of power system optimization, electrical engineering problem, there are MEMS problems, there are nano system problem, things like that which are, which are very amenable for, uh, for uh, optimal control application including uh, probably biomedical engineering as well actually. People have actually used that for solving uh, cancer treatment and things like that. So, this is all I want to talk in this particular lecture. Uh, so, there are enough motivations for us to, to go ahead and look look all details of optimal control theory in general. But before moving further, we will talk some of this review of some of the other concepts uh, so that we will be feeling comfortable actually. All right. So, this is the part of this lecture. Uh, I thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye.